A maven, an expert, an authority, a connoisseur, a specialist, a professional, a knowledge king, a rock and roll sports talker. Coons Ford of Security Boulevard is proud to present The Sports Maven with Bruce Posner, a no-holds-barred look at the sports world. Now, here's Bruce Posner, The Sports Maven. Can you believe, Danny Mason, it's not raining today? It's almost unbelievable. The sun's out. It's supposed to be beautiful. I'm heading over to the City Open this afternoon, watch a little tennis with my man Steve Krulovitz. Uh, can't have to take car. You can't take carts on the golf course. That's it for me. <laughs> All right, let's bring in my good buddy, Talk some Memorial Baseball. Stan, the fan, Charles. Stan, how are you this morning? I'm pretty good, Bruce. It is uh, when you just said that, it just dawned on me that there was something kind of special about today, and that is that the sun is out. <laughs> this is a you know what this is. This is like that uh, Dallas season that was horrible, and and Bobby woke up and it never happened. This summer between the Orioles and the weather is just been a, li- a disaster. You're leaving, out my, you're leaving out my fantasy baseball team. Oh uh, well, that's a that's a yearly thing though. All right. That's, that's, that's retirement. I asked Jeremy Kahn how Stan's team d- is, is doing in the uh, in the fantasy baseball, and he, he just chuckled. He said, "Not so good." <laughs> yeah. All yeah, right. I think, let's put it in one quick perspective, and then we'll move on to the real stuff. Uh, the Orioles' season makes my season look pretty. You know, their season looks pretty good compared to my my team. So you're calling it quits. All right. Yeah. I got Mason yeah. in the house with me today. All right. Ah, oh, you got the you got the number one, numero uno, N- number one intern of the world, the, the Viner youngster. Uh, he's in the house with me today. All right, let's yeah. get right down to the O's. Uh, I was on another station yesterday. I expressed my opinion. I'm all yeah. in. I thought everything they did was right. I thought moving scope was right because you didn't need that burden of his the money he would have to make. What's your take, Stan? Your overall take on the whole move? Well, I think uh, I think that they've got a two prong reason for for starting this um, rebuild at at this particular time. With the boys taking the team over, I think some of it is actually financial. I mean, you know, the Orioles were on a hundred and sixty million dollar payroll going into two thousand seventeen. They they shaved that by about twenty million. Uh, going into this year, uh, you know, with some some jettisons of a couple contracts and trades and things, but uh, they were still at 140 million dollars. I think you'll see that in 2019, that that payroll is going to be more like 75 or 80 million dollars. And I, I'm not saying that all of the money that's saved is going to go into you know um, uh, international signings and increasing analytics and increasing overall scouting. But I think you could see 15 or $20 million being reinvested into the team with a, with a, for now, a payroll that makes some sense. So I think it was a two-pronged, um, you know, a two-pronged effort here to shave payroll because you can lose at 75 and $80 million. And I think the fans are, uh, are understanding that. Uh, my only question, Bruce, is uh, where's the transparency? I think we'd really like to know, is Dan Duquette really the guy in charge, the guy who's telling us what all these new plans are? Uh, because about four or five weeks ago, most of us in the media had him as a dead man walking. And um, that's the only thing that, that is not exciting right now is that the, the game plan is not being enunciated either by the boys or a team president that really is in charge. That'll come next. Uh, looks like it's going to wait until the end of the season. Uh, but that's the next step, whether it is Dan and Buck keeping their jobs or Brady or somebody else. That's really the one failing of this whole move so far. I think there's no way they release or fire or whatever Dan Duquette. I mean, he or uh, in my opinion, he orchestrated all these trades from what I hear. And it's kind of like his baby now. And uh, he must have a game plan. But I guess, you know, he's waiting to get re-signed. I mean, I, I really don't know. Well, but the, 
the game plan he's enunciated it makes a tremendous amount of sense. It's, it's what a lot of us, you know, that follow the team on a day to basis, on a day to day basis, we're scratching our heads about over the last couple of years. And uh, you know, the word that comes to mind, Bruce, is we had a nice run here for four years, from 2012. Uh, to 2016, you know, but the, it wasn't sustainable. And the reason it wasn't sustainable is still the, the big problem. The 8,000 pound elephant in the room is that the club does not develop enough talent to keep a pipeline going. And that's really where the sustainability comes in. You know, the Dodgers, it's not like the Dod, they have a gigantic payroll, but some of the key players for the Dodgers are Max Muncy. Chris Taylor. These are guys that they pick up off the scrap heap, and that goes along with their prospects, and that does go along with a free agent or two or a Clayton Kershaw, you know, unique talent that you have. But the Orioles continue to languish uh, at not being able to develop players, and that's got to be the biggest change moving forward. Let me let me let me ask you some tough questions, and Danny wants yep. to ask you a tough one too. Because I got to ask you yep. a tough. I know I'm a limited time with you. Number one, does Buck come back? That is, that is a tough question. I mean, you know, on a pure managerial basis, you'd say, why would you change Buck Showalter? Uh, but the bottom line is, um, managers, in my opinion, should be difference makers. Um, and I don't know that Buck is any longer a difference maker in Baltimore. All right. Do the Orioles keep Adam Jones? That's going to be a very <laughs> difficult. That's going to be a very difficult question. I mean, he's such Dan a Duquette, he's such a model citizen. He lo- Dan, du- Dan Duquette is talking as if that isn't even a remote possibility. Right. But you know, for for an organization that just brought back Brooks Robinson, and the fans love that. They brought back Eddie Murray, and the fans love that. Um, To to let him go in certain ways sends sends a a mixed message. So I'd say that's probably a 60-40 no, but I think there's going to be, you know, stories like what he did yesterday uh, with the $8,500 donation to the Little League team, the African-American Little League team in Washington. Those, those stories resonate with people, and I think the Orioles need to do a better job at reaching out to the African-American community, and Adam Jones is certainly a great ambassador. If he does come back, I know I'm a little long-winded. He's got to be a corner outfielder, though. He's no longer a, a top-rate center. Fielder. I don't think that would be a problem. Go ahead, Danny. You had something you want to ask? Yeah, Stan, uh, we're talking about the Orioles as uh, almost a por- post-mortem now, but when you look back on the 2012 and even to a lesser degree the 2014 season, but definitely 2012, when they burst on the scene, everyone said that they were an overachieving team. They were a one-run team, winning these extra mm-hmm. inning games unlikely. How do you feel looking back on this team, how it was built, even with that amazing stretch of success? People want That's to... Really a, I mean, that's like, really a, ter- that's yeah. a terrific question, Danny. Really, it, it. I thought the Orioles going into the postseason in 2014, I thought they were the best team in baseball at that point, and they got kind of schooled by the Kansas City Royals, uh, who were really built the right way. But it's funny, they were built the right way, and they've had to do almost the exact same thing the Orioles have done. That's right. It's, it's hard to jettison really good talent that's still prime, but you, you know you got to do it, and both teams are, they're the two worst teams in the American League. Maybe the White Sox are worse, worse than both of them, uh, actually, but they're two of the worst teams in baseball, and they played in a series that I thought was pivotal to the Orioles really being something, and at the end of the day, they were a very flawed offensive team. They really were. They were a great defensive team. They had an incredible bullpen. The starting pitching was never great, but it it won because the defense was great, because they had the long ball capabilities, and Bucks Bucks handling of the bullpen was masterful. But I think the question you ask, they were a flawed team even when they were at their best. Stan, Jonathan Jonathan Villar, who the Orioles got from the Brewers, has had a great start here in Baltimore. Do you see him as a long-term guy, or are they just going to let him go? Um, 
you know, I, to me, he makes an awful lot of sense. He's, he's a free agent at the end of the year, but he makes two point seven million dollars, and um, he makes a lot of sense to me. I, I think you you can get caught up in what position people play, uh, but one of the positions uh, that a, a team needs to have somebody successful at is getting on base at the top of the lineup. They have nobody else in the organization that is as close to being what they need out of that leadoff spot. I haven't watched them enough over the years. Uh, it's interesting that Houston let them go in a big trade with Milwaukee. Uh, but, you know, uh, he's, he's certainly a guy whose skill set could be used here. Now, you didn't ask me about the other player. Um, Bruce knows I was away for a while. When Tim Beckham came back, oh, and every God. night I'm getting every night I'm getting a different text that Tim Beckham. This is since he's been back. He's made eight errors just since he's made fifteen on the year, and he's played what forty games this year, thirty five games. He's made eight since the All Star break. Uh, I don't see Tim Beckham back. Um, it was a nice attempt by Dan to jumpstart the offense. Uh, I hope and pray Tobias Myers never turns out to be that great a, a pitching prospect. That's a good 19-year-old kid we gave up for him. But, boy, is he a bad defensive player. He's the worst I've ever seen. Worst I've ever he's, seen. He's, he's one of the worst. And Jim Palmer last night, poor Jimmy, goes, well, one of his problems is he doesn't have good hands. <laughs> well, I mean, how do, you, how do you have an infielder that's playing any of the key positions? I mean, you know, the only place he could play for me is be a spare part in the outfield. He's absolutely terrible at, at in the infield. And I didn't see that in the 60 games he played last year, you know, with the team. i tell you something funny. I, you know, after the Orioles beat the Yankees the other day, I went on to the Yes Network to see the postmortems. And right. they, they viewed that game as an ultra-devastating loss. All right? Yeah. I mean... The manager and the guys on the you know the guys who do the uh, do the show, they were yeah. ju- they said that that loss. The manager came on and said, you know, we just lost a game that we could not afford to lose, and you know and that made me feel good. And then, then to watch them get blitzed in the first two games against the Red Sox, I got to tell you, they're on the cusp of getting like kind of a semi eliminated. Uh, yeah, they they were four and three last week, and this week they're one and three, so they're five and six over their last eleven games, and that's why Boston is seven and three. So um, they are, you know, I, I'll tell you what, it's gotten so bad with the Yankees, and we're only talking about a week. Remember the Orioles in 1983, Bruce? I think they lost seven games in a row, either two or three times in that season. Um, so the Yankees have enough firepower to come back. They got very unlucky with this Jay Happ. They pick him up and he wins a game the next day, and then he's got foot, hand, and mouth disease. Uh, he's on the disabled list, so they had to bring up another young pitcher uh, to start a game today, Chance Adams. They're they're not only on the cusp of losing the division. You know that Seattle is only about Oakland is now blown past Seattle. Right. Oakland is about two and a half, three games in front of Seattle. Seattle is only three wins behind the Yankees, so they've got they've got to come in on both flanks. You know, they could be miraculously as it sounds, they could be on the outside looking in in about a week or two unless they pull it together, and uh, they really need to do that. Yeah, Severino. I mean, saying that he didn't throw at Mookie Betts was a joke last night. I mean, I. I I wasn't paying attention to it. Yeah. We had people, company in town, and we took these young girls out to dinner. Then I got home in time to turn on the Oriole game, and, and it was one nothing When I literally turned the game on, it was one nothing, and Gallo had just hit the home run to make it 3 to nothing. And I turn around, get a glass of water, and sit down. It's 8 to nothing. Yeah, at the bottom of the eighth inning, it was funny. Jim was a Palmer, I don't remember, said there were two men on, and uh, we were talking right. about how find Bruce I mean Mike Wright was p- been pitching and he has been and yeah, he has. they said he's got to get out of this inning but you know or you know the Orioles right. could still come what's what game is he watching you know right, right, right. what game uh, that, like those two runs mattered you know yeah well it was 
very frustrating, though, to see Mike Wright take a, a step backwards. Hopefully, that's a brief step backwards, because I'll tell you the one thing that's it's really interesting, no matter how bad a team can be, uh, one of the easier things to do is reset that bullpen. And i got to tell you, I'm not predicting they're going to be Oriole Hall of Famers or anything, but uh, Cody Carroll and Evan Phillips, uh, look like they could be pieces uh, toward reestablishing a, a strong bullpen. You know, and Givens has had a terrible year this year. Um, I really hope one of the guys that goes, and I don't say that that much because I have a, a great appreciation for how hard the pitching and hitting coaches work. Uh, I'm not a fan of Roger McDowell's. I don't see pitchers improve under him. Uh, and Michael Gibbons has taken a, a significant step backward this year. Yeah, that's an understatement. All right, I told you I'd get you off the air quarter after. It's quarter after. Uh, All right. Tell everybody about your show today, where they can find you. Well, they can find me uh, right at 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock. Craig Heist was supposed to sit in with me today. He's my co-host. He's been filling in for um, Phil Wood over on the Masson side on the Nats show, but the Nats were rained out last night. So I'll be flying solo, but uh, you can reach it on the radio, uh, on the Internet radio at pressboxonline.com slash radio, or you can watch us on Facebook Live uh, at uh, uh, facebook.com slash pressboxsports. We're on for two hours. We've got a great group of guests today. Uh, lined up, and uh, and then I'll be on after the uh, game tonight, Bruce, uh, doing after bird watching. Yeah, I think I'm going to join in tonight, all right? You need some of my comments. <laughs> all right. Love to, love to see him there. Thank you for having me on. It's great to hear Mason's in there today. He is the number one intern. All right. In all of sports. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Stan, and uh, right. we'll see you soon. All right. Uh, he's, you know, I my take you know, it's funny, he made a comment, and when you read this stuff about Adam Jones donating, he had a clear blue sky. I mean, no, it's not a lot of money to him, but just the fact that he did it. Absolutely. He heard about it, and he did it. It's like, geez, he was figuring out a way to keep him, you know? Maybe he'll take a little bit less. It seems like he will. I, I don't. I completely disagree with you. Just because he didn't approve a trade to the Phillies doesn't even necessarily mean he won't a trade, uh, approve a trade later this month to a better team, a better situation. But here's what you're not thinking about. He's a happily married man. Yeah, from okay. a Baltimore girl. He just bought Cal a, Ripken's house. Cal Ripken's house for three million dollars. He, you know, I talked to Robbie Davis yesterday when I was on the air, and Robbie brought us some great points. He said he's got he's worth like eighty million dollars. Absolutely. He let, has a house in Baltimore. He loves his family. It means a lot to him at his age not to have to go on the road and like. Be away from his family. That's true. I'm telling you that this guy is like, uh, you can understand where he comes from. But I, and he had every right to turn down oh that my trade. God. I'm so 100% with you on that. But the problem with Jones staying is that how often do you actually see athletes make that comfortable decision when they have that urge to win? And he's de he's described the fact that despite the fact that he declined that uh, d uh, waiving his 10-5 rights, he still wants to win. And not only that... He's he does not have a good relationship with Dan Duquette. I think your situation is a lot more realistic if Dan Duquette is not back as the GM. And the the prominent narrative right now, based on all these moves that I made, that Dan Duquette is the one who looks like he's in charge. If Dan, Dan Duquette, Duquette just about said he's gone. Yeah, exactly. And listen, if you listen to Jones's comments about Duquette, it's very clear that they are not on the same page. One of the big reasons in principle why he turned down the ability to uh, waive his uh, 10 and 5 rights is because he was so offended that the Orioles waited until three days before the deadline. I mean, he literally said in a quote, and he was on CC Sabathia's podcast this week talking about it. They had all year. We all knew from probably April 20th that this team had to sell everything. We were talking about this a year ago, but we knew for a fact this team was the worst team in baseball before the end of April. So the Orioles had the entire first half and even after the All-Star break to go up to Adam and have any sort of conversation about A, either bringing him back or B, waiving his 10-5 and five rights. Apparently they went up to him two and a half days before the trade deadline and say, hey, we have a trade on the, for, to the Phillies on the table and he would have to platoon with a rookie in right field. I mean, if he wants to play right field and he's already said it, he said, bring up Mullins, I'll play right field right now. He said it. He actually said it. So let's keep him around till the end of the year, I say. See 
see if maybe oh, you get rid of question. Duquette. I, I don't waver him. I no. mean, you know, I, I'm with you. But listen, he's not coming back if Duquette's coming back. So if they, hopefully, the Orioles make the decision that Duquette isn't coming back, and they do bring back Adam Jones. I'm not sure if Adam Jones is going to do that. But you're right. Yeah, you but just, no, he could retire. He he could. He, he could just, retire. He just bought that beautiful estate. Right. I mean, that house and his family, and you know, it's it's the whole thing. Mason, you got some? Why are we seeing a problem with these people? in the organization having conversations like they didn't have a conversation with scope not man no you're right not that's, Adam. that's a history that's their history but isn't that part of their job even if they knew they weren't going to keep any of those guys to go up to them and say hey here's what we can give you or here's the trade so we're looking at what do you think about that they could have probably yeah. got maddie eight years or seven years ago or six years ago they could have got scope too oh absolutely and, you know? and 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 that's what probably makes me so uh reticent about all, listen I'm with you, Bruce. I could not be more happy that the Orioles at least are going in this direction, finally. But a lot of this messaging that a lot of people are biting so uh, hard on, I, I, I don't really buy it because there's a lot of things that they still have to prove. Got to go to the first break. First segment was brought to you by Coons Ford of Baltimore, Coons Ford Security, and of course, Dennis Galatis. I was on a show yesterday, and uh, hey, we're going to talk about the next segment. Everybody's pumped on the Ravens right now, for sure. But uh, hundreds of trucks in stock, hundreds of cars, still have 0% for 72 months, plus $1,000 on so many cars. Head out to Coons Ford today. If you buy a car today, you'll get one hell of a lunch because Dennis loads up that place with the best food in Baltimore. Anyway, this is Bruce Posner back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Welcome back to Sports Maven, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, once again, here's Bruce Posner, Sports Maven. You know, this is one of the most beautiful radio stations in the country, in my opinion. And I've been to, you know, maybe 10 of them. There's nothing like it, except for one thing. Nobody keeps pens and pencils. What is the story? You're always <laughs> taking my pen. I'm always taking your pen because someone always takes my pen from in here. I, but I why aren't there like a thousand pens? This is a multi-million dollar place. I'm, I couldn't agree with you more. And you can't find... You can't, preach, Bruce. Louder for the people in the back. Wait a minute. And plus, you can't find paper. You know <laughs> That's true. Paper. Yeah. Scratch paper you can't find. I feel like that's how it is in most office spaces. You have this beautiful space, and yet they, they uh, penny pinch when it comes to the actual supplies. I don't think it's penny pinch. I think it's disappearance, you know? Yeah, people are stealing them. This studio, if you've ever yeah. been to this studio, it's unbelievable. Go ahead. I got, so in our office, it's me, Wayne, my brother Jordan, and the other day he goes, you two, you two take all my pens. <laughs> Like, I, I got no pens left. And it's just like, speaks right to you. People just don't care in the office space. They just they'll, they'll, they'll walk out of the place with the pens in their pockets and stuff, and then you never see them again. I brought, true story, and we'll get onto this in a second, but a few months ago, I went to California, and I brought back, for the studio, I brought back four souvenir pens that said San Francisco, Oakland, <laughs> uh, all bunch of stuff. They were all gone within about 10 days. Unbelievable. I mean, who's stealing souvenir pens? I said stealing. They, like, vanish. They disappear. But <laughs> you're taking my, you're the producer. Little, you're little taking gnomes. my pen. Yeah, I'll give it back. All right. Well, you know. You can have it. <laughs> anyway, all right, listen. When the trade, when the signing of RG3 was made, my young gentleman to the right here is a big fan, uh, Mason, and he proved himself maybe to be right the other day after RG3 had what we all considered a very, very good performance. He didn't make any mistakes. He can't help but that uh, Brashad Perriman cannot hold on to a ball, you know, after he gets a $647,000 bonus. But uh, he played very well. So, Mason, what is it about RG3 that you think he, he's not done yet? When he took the year off, I always thought it was a great idea for him. Talking about a guy that came out every time on the field and was just injured. So the year off, I thought, was a step in the right direction. And then the Ravens were nice enough to give him a chance, and he took that, and it looks like he's running with it. Yeah, he is. And and what I liked about it was his pocket presence, was the way he evaded the rush. Uh, he put the ball on the money. Uh, I don't think he had he had the one interception, which was ridiculous. And I know he was only seven for 11 or something for 58 or 60 yards, but I only played a quarter and maybe one in one possession in the second quarter. So. I'm telling you that he had a heck of a game, and you got to remember he's not. He didn't have Crabtree in there. He didn't have uh, Brown, John Brown. He didn't have anybody. But uh, I thought he played great. And the other guy who came out of it, in my eyes, looking fantastic, was Hayden Hurst. 
All right. He was just, he only had three catches, targeted four times, had one called back. But he was able to snatch the ball out of the air. He had, uh, he just had a great game. And, and to me, that's like the best thing in the world for Joe. Now, Joe was sitting there, as usual, showing tremendous emotion, cheering on the team, <laughs> right? jumping in the air when RG3 threw a touchdown, patting Lamar Jackson on the back. No, he oh, didn't, do, he oh, didn't do any of that. that. All right? He almost sat with a grimace on his face the entire time. Why did they bring him? They should have just left him home if he didn't want to be there. Oh, man, you it, know? His, his, he, if, Unless I missed something. No, I'd love to have a body language doctor uh, take an evaluation of, of Joe Flacco. But, uh, oh, man. But hey, you know what? If he's if he's nothing else, he's consistent because that that's been Joe his entire career. So yeah, but uh, it was a little a little little off-putting. much, a little off putting. Yeah, but uh, you know Lamar Jackson. Now, tell Mason. You know you follow him very closely in Louisville. Most exciting quarterback you've seen? To me, I like players that can really drive the ball down the field. You know, I'm not a big fan of the spread offense, but he was an exciting player. He made plays from nothing to something. He constantly made the game somewhat more exciting to watch because the team around him wasn't necessarily great, but he was the one that pushed him to the next level. With the Ravens, though, in the NFL, it's just a whole different story. Everyone on there was the best, the second best, the third best on their team, so you're competing against the best of the college football players, which is going to make it tough when you're the one that's outrunning players and that's how you kind of play. you got to you know, take a step back and evaluate your scheme and really get a pocket presence on the next level. Well, listen, He, I thought that he handled the, uh, the huddle well, a great touchdown pass to Hayden Hurst, a bad mistake on an interception out in the flat. But geez, who whiz, it was his first game ever. I mean, I, you know, people are so, they're looking at it so closely. This guy, in my opinion, should not play this year. He should learn and learn and learn, not get thrown in there and take a tremendous beating, which is why I would keep three quarterbacks. Without question. And if something ever happened to Joe, Joe, Lord forbid, go in with the RG3, you know, and then, you know, and then maybe let Lamar Jackson. You, I know he's a first round pick, but you just can't throw him into the line den like that, especially because he's not he's not really your or your normal or, you know, regular quarterback. He needs adjustment time. And uh, to me, though, from what I saw, he ran a ball for 11 yards where nothing was there. He uh, was able, he very easily avoids the rush. And the offensive line that was playing for him was disgraceful. I mean, it was like, uh, it was like open season on him. So, uh, but then some people say, well, he's got to rein his game in. He can't run. He can't. Let me tell you something. That's, well, that's who he it is. That's who he is, absolutely. It's the same thing with RG3. you got to be smarter. you got to get out of bounds. you got to slide. you got to do all the things to avoid getting hurt. But you can't take that uh, ability to scramble and run and pick up uh, huge yards away from his game. Absolutely not. I think the fact that Lamar Jackson is uh, getting all this uh, very absolutist uh, judgment after the first preseason game of five, by the way. I mean, he's gonna, we're going to get a lot of opportunities to see him this summer, and I still feel like if he has an awful five-game stretch, you still can't make any sort of determinations on him. I'm with you. I, I've, at one point, I really did think that if the Orioles started off, cat, I'm sorry, the Ravens started off catastrophically, they started off like 0-6 oh, or 7, and they're on the other side of the Steelers game, like a, a change could be made. It's nothing Nothing's going to happen until December at the absolute earliest, and the season has to be dead. But at the same time, I mean, these are correctable mistakes. I, I don't like the fans who instantly write him off because he's a mobile quarterback. The game has been more and more uh, you know what, adjusting to you that know what sort else, of Danny, in, in the NFL, you could be three and five after eight games, and your season's not over. Not necessarily. You know? It doesn't look good, but if you go six and two the rest of the way, you got a shot to make the playoffs. When was the last time that I mean, listen, this this may be a new uh, Ravens team, but it's been a couple years since you've had the confidence that this team has the ability to go on a six and two stretch. I mean, it's been, but at the same time, I I'm ex- I'm excited about Lamar Jackson. He's going to be on the field whether people like it or not. And I mean, they're they're again, it's his throwing base and, and and making sure that he's set for throws and stuff like that. This is stuff that you can learn with discipline. He's going to get an opportunity to sit down and watch it, and I, I'm I'm still excited about him. Let's say they're like. I don't know, eight and six going down to the last two games, and they need one to make the playoffs. Go nine and seven. RG three comes out, Joe goes down, and he's terrible. Do you go to Lamar Jackson? Yeah, in that case, you do. In that case, you do. But then again, you know, 
if if we all remember, I'm pretty sure I'm right about this. When they pulled out uh, Tony, uh, what was Tony Banks. Tony Banks after the Redskin game when mm-hmm. the Redskins beat us. What was it, ten to three or something? Yeah, yeah, that was in, in Washington. Yeah. You know, and we hadn't scored a touchdown. Well, the first game in, Dilford didn't do much better. No. So to to judge a guy. On one game is almost unfair. So, but, but people would be judging RG three on being RG three at that point, and I and I feel like I mean, and that's another very uh, interesting point, and we touched on it a little bit last segment. But with with, with RG three, I think we have an opportunity potentially to with the team carrying three quarterbacks for the first time in a few years. This could be a very very exciting opportunity. Now, people might roll their eyes at RG three, but if he gets an opportunity to be this this mentor and just be this all important swing guy. I've heard reports saying that there are other teams barring him having an amazing, amazing preseason. No other team is really interested in signing him. No one was interested. Yeah, in but that could change real quick. I understand that, but no that one, was, no one was interested in re-signing him when the Ravens signed him earlier in the offseason. And there's an opportunity here for RG3, even if he does get cut, to still be the uh, basically the unofficial third quarterback of the Ravens, be one of these guys who they can sign and pick up and re-add to the roster at any point. Um, and listen, Look, knowing the Ravens, if he has a good... Uh, he's going to get all... You know, Flacco's going to play one series... And maybe in the third game he might play a what quarter, a half yeah. you know and that's it yeah all right he's barely going to play in the four games left he's not even going to play one game so you're going to see a lot of rg3 and a lot of lamar jackson and i'll tell you this much it's the first time i ever looked forward to watch an exhibition game Absolutely. thursday night all right and because you knew you're going to see a lot of uh rg3 i mean rg3 and lamar, lamar. jackson but uh Hunter Hurst was great. I thought Orlando Brown showed some signs of promise for a guy who has all the wrong immeasurables, measurables rather, and just like his dad did, though. But he's big. He's a big dude. And, you know, he's tough to get around. But I, I thought he was somewhat impressive. Uh you know, and, and what's the name? Korea had a great game. Oh, he, it's, and that was probably the most underrated storyline of the entire uh, game. People want to talk about Lamar and his debut. Kamale Correa is probably one of the most key figures on the Ravens defense, and most people haven't really heard his name very much over the last few years just by him being a pretty prominent draft pick. Well, being on the outside right now, is he a starter? He, well, there there might need him to be. I mean, he's not going to probably be out there on week one listed as the starter unless he has an amazing camp. But they need more depth on the outside linebacker and inside linebacker. It's a very, very uh, big position for them to come up uh, with those old draft picks to actually come through. And uh, that was a big first step for Kamala Correa. Mason, I'll give you two minutes. I know you're a big Redskin fan. Uh, how's the looks on Alex Smith, uh, Smith been so far? Well, for Alex Smith right now, Andy Reid's throwing shade at him, saying that we don't need a check down guy anymore, that Mahomes can really throw the ball down the field, and you know it's almost like a new offense for him. Other than that, team's looking pretty strong right now. Josh Doxson has more injury problems. On the defensive side of the ball, they're looking for some defensive linemen to step up, get a pass rush, be able to stop the run, because looking back at these past few years, the Redskins' inability to stop the run has really done them in for some playoff teams otherwise. But Alex Smith overall, I mean, I like Alex Smith. I like I like quarterbacks who don't make mistakes. And yeah, he might be a check down guy, but he just doesn't make mistakes. And, he, you know, he, wherever he's associated, that's a cheap shot for Andy Reid. It really is. But, that, you know, I don't know why he would do that, but that's the NFL, I guess. But uh, by the way, I know I was talking the jacket ceremony last night in the Hall of Fame was fantastic. And naturally, they saved Ray for last. And But really... I'm sorry, Bruce, for interrupting. Over under 30 minutes for his speech tonight. Oh, I don't know. That's a tough one. He, tough so one. He, was on the, he was on the sideline during Who's the game. Who's introducing him? That's a good question. He was on the sideline during the game talking to Shannon Sharp, and Shannon Sharp was like uh, trying to push him for it, and Ray was trying to make the claim that it was 22 and a half minutes. That, and that, that's his estimate. So I, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be a comfortable 35-minute uh, speech tonight. Well... Whatever. He deserves he it. He deserves it. Yeah, he deserves it. But uh, what a class to be in. Oh, and my what gosh. A, just an utterly stupid move by T.O. not being there. I couldn't agree How with you more. How could you not want to be there? Well, see, the thing is, I could understand why he's salty. Yeah, but nobody knows. But not only that, but I'm saying that he could be go up there and be salty and have the entire world be his platform. I mean, he could go up there and slam all the writers if he wanted to. He could go up there and give what middle year, fingers. What year did he make it in his second year? Yes, it was a second year of oh, eligibility. I mean, that's, do you have a guy that's, what, been up there for 30 years now? Yeah. That's coming in this year? Yeah. I just, 
it's just such a disgrace to the game. But it plays into who he's always been. Yeah. Just a... Uh, they didn't... Well, he never got in trouble off the field. Right. But on the field, he was known to be, you know, kind of full of himself. I mean, and he was doing the uh, sit-ups in his in his uh, driveway that one time. So I guess that's off the field. Jerry Kramer was one of the greatest, you know, I guess he was a tackle right. or whatever. And, you know, every, he's known for the ice bowl block. But uh, I could not believe he wasn't in the Hall of Fame. Right. I could not believe it. And... Uh, the dead, what's the uh, the dead, the daddy of doom, uh, Brazil? Oh yeah, right? yeah. I couldn't believe he wasn't in. So sometimes, for whatever reasons, you know, he probably had a few of the press who didn't like him out of Philadelphia or whatever, and he didn't get in. But big deal, he got in the second year, and nobody knows, nobody cares. It doesn't say first ballot on your nobody, on your nobody bus, says so. it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, did you see that the Hall of Fame shot back at him, though? What did they say? They said that they're not really running his highlights. Or See, the thing is, so I, I, I've heard uh, conflicting stories on that, because apparently the, they say that they are going to have him as part of the video package and all that stuff, and they, they will not scrub him from the ceremony. However, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of little passive-aggressive remarks about is how they the, wish, they wish he, that he was there. Is he the first guy ever to do that? I think he is. I mean, like, at least a person who didn't have a health issue. Well, the health issue, we know, but uh, I mean... I still don't believe it. I really don't believe that he didn't want to show up there. What a stage. Yeah, that's and that's what I'm saying. I mean, you, you, you I mean, think, it's not, look, I'm you, watching it this year because of Ray. Right. And I watched it, uh, what, two years ago because of Ogden or whatever it was. But but you watch it and you Absolutely. see these guys crying and hugging their fathers. And Randy Moss was besides himself. And it was. And you know what else? When these guys go in together. It becomes their class, right? Their graduation class, and there's a bond there that is forever. And you could see Erlacher and Ray, and Erlach and Ray and, and uh, Dawkins and yeah, Dawkins. They absolutely. were all. It was like a bond that you can't uh, define. And and To's like out of the loop. All right, let's get out to our second break. That segment, second segment, was brought to you by Science and Kirk. And yes, in the nest is coming up on Sundays at nine o'clock once again. And we happen to have an employee here from Science and Kirk, Danny. Could yes, you sir. Tell us about Science and Kirk. Science and Kirk will help you with any sort of personal injury, uh, auto accident, uh, any sort of case where you feel that you have been harmed. Contact Science and Kirk one eight hundred lawyers. You've got a lawyer dot com, or I'm sorry, you have a lawyer. Dot com. That's very important. Uh, they're a wonderful family-owned uh, operation. They uh, work with attorneys across the country to make sure that you have the best coverage for your injuries. 1-800-LAWYERS, the Science and Kirk family, amazing people to work with. And they are across the country, but they're based in Baltimore. Yes, so very local boys, but they they will uh, absolutely help anyone yeah, you'll, out, you'll anywhere get, across you'll the country. You'll get Baltimore guys involved in it between Science and the Kirk family, because there's a lot of them. Unless you live in California, and we will find a, the best California lawyer for you. Yeah, or they'll go out there themselves. All right, with that, we'll head out to break number two. It's Bruce Poser along with Mason Viner and Danny. Back in a few minutes to go around the horn. A lot of subjects today. Back here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. This is the Sports Maven Show. Presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, here's the Maven himself, Bruce Posner. All right. Back here on segment three, talking about Mason's career. Uh, it's something I'm very involved in and looking for him to move up and on as he begins to, en- to enter college. When the applications, what do you start them, like in uh, November or something? Like now. Yeah. Like August now? 1st is the um, day where they all Open release. Up. Yeah. So you could apply now to schools. Yeah. Yeah, wow. m- m- most uh, kids, I mean, when I was in high school, which was granted a scary amount of time ago I, I started my searches probably around uh, the beginning of the school year of my senior year I started going on the tours and all that stuff and had all my applications and before the end of November who so. leads the pack right now Mason or is it wide open who leads the pack Maryland I mean oh, okay. come on. Well, it's more, that... you, you can't you gotta have a couple others too. oh yeah I do um Right now, I'm looking South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee. Oh, my God. Or the SEC. Well, he likes yeah. good football. Yeah. Is this, you know, have you been to all those places? No, we got a trip planned for the about the middle of October is what we're looking for. Yeah. To go to three or four of them? Yeah, that's, that's when I did mine. Right. All right. Well, you know, we'll be there to help you along the way. Uh, Maryland's so tough to get into now. You really, you know. <laughs> It's just, it's tough. It really is. It's almost unbelievable. But We can still talk about the... I got to uh, feel Mason will get in. No, we can I talk really about do. the lacrosse championship from last year, if that'll make you feel better. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, you know, that ship has sailed, sort of, all right? <laughs> of course, I had Jesse Bernhardt on Wednesday. We never yeah. mentioned it. 
We, that's funny. We never mentioned the title. All yeah, right. Well, because you were talking about the more recent title, yeah, the gold medal, the World Cup. Yeah, Jesse. Oh, what a what a what a series he had in there. It was just great. And we had to pay our dues to Paul Rabel because he was unbelievable. Well, thank you for Jesse really for joining quick. us too. What stupid rules is that? F I L L. It's 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 a throwback to ten years ago, to stalling and everything wrong about lacrosse. that has been changed. You know their new thing is they're trying to abolish the face off. I think it's great. So somebody scores, the other team gets the ball, and you just start moving. It's just such. It makes the game unique. To me, it makes the game unique. Yeah, they've done it before. One year they did it, and it did not. I don't remember what year it was, but it was a long time back. And but, where where do you start with the ball? When, when it goes in the cage, you take it out of the cage and you go. In other words, the team that gets scored upon has the ball, and it's a more it's a more non Trevor Baptiste. I mean, it's like. It removes the effect that somebody that uh, Baptiste could have, but it's a faster game because the goal is to get the ball out, get up the field, a lot of transition. But uh, they should practice it. They should like do exhibitions when uh, they scrimmage, you know, and see how it works. But to me, you know, I don't know. Face-offs, ground balls has always been a Maryland thing. But, you know. What the hell? It's July. We'll get to we'll get to lacrosse uh, when the finals of the uh, MLL occur, which is only a couple weeks away. We are scheduled, and you have nine teams because the Bayhawks are, are the Bayhawks done. No, they got one more game. I think they got one more, but they clinched playoffs. Right, they already clinched the playoffs. They played at New York tonight, I think. But uh, good season for the Bayhawks. All right, around the horn a little bit. Mason Schneider Herod has left Maryland to pursue professional opportunities. I was reading the day in Terrapin Times, he left Maryland because he felt like he was never going to play. Well, that's one way of looking at it. The other way is his last coach at Mississippi State called him a six. Bruce, do you know what a, do you know what a six is? Something bad. It is a center that cannot move. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's called the six. So the guy who's out of place there. Jeff Ehrman first reported it this past week saying that it kind of blindsided the coaches, some of the players. No one really knew what was going on. Yeah, which, you know, if a guy was going to be an integral, productive part of a team, they would have seen it coming. But obviously he was fringe, in my opinion. How is he fringe? That just shows, to me, kind of how bad he could have been. Well, maybe that was the case. Now we got Bender playing center. Well, look at the guy. That, look at the guy last year. They had, what's the name, Obi? Yeah, Sean Obi. I mean, what did he do all year? Foul. This, this was a <laughs> this was a Duke transfer. And Rice, you, okay, Rice to Duke couldn't get on the fort. Injured at Duke to Maryland. So he didn't really play at Duke. Well, he was on Duke. I know, but he <laughs> he mean, was he was out of basketball for a few years. You know, he did have some good seasons, but I, I know what you're saying. And Schneider Herod is kind of the opposite of that. He didn't play well at Mississippi State. That's where was why he's not first? There. This was his third, second transfer, wasn't it? No, Mississippi State. Ye- I believe it was Mississippi State year off Maryland second semester last year. And for some reason, he wasn't even going to be eligible till second semester this year. His so future, they his, didn't really miss that much. I mean, no, but they got to find somebody. They got to find another big guy because, wow, you're putting too much. On, J- on Jalen Smith and Fernando. I mean, what are they going to do, play the whole game? Bender and Tomajic. Well, Bender, we don't even know. Is it he still hurt? Yeah, torn meniscus still coming back from it. He is, I believe, has assumed basketball activities, but, you know, it's a big difference between playing in a Big Ten game and basketball activities. Outside of the depth of the big men, which isn't important in the Big Ten, <laughs> but uh, outside of that, the team, I think, is in pretty good shape. Yeah, we're finally going to get to see a backup point guard with Cyril Smith, who will be backing up Anthony Cowan. He's a scoring guard. This is one of the freshmen coming in. Was an Ole Miss commit, dropped the Ole Miss, and now he came to Maryland as a late commit. Uh, we're going to see him. Backup we're almost point out guard. of time, so I want to interrupt you. Urban Meyer, do you think he survives? No. No. Yeah, I, I not... think he's going to get his money, though, because there's no. no real proof that – he knew so, and and that was the big part of his statement yesterday, which by the way was one of the most bogus non apologies I've ever seen in my entire life. But the way that he worded that legally was basically to make the point that if they fire him, there's no cause because he didn't knowingly uh, lie. But it, he was dishonest, and I think he needs to go. Yeah, well, where does that put them for this year? Really quick, huh. in flux. But I mean, the team you might still what? do well. There'll still be a twenty yes, point absolutely. favorite over Maryland. 
Oh, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> just on talent. Just on talent. No coaches, I'm not sure if they would. You know, it's funny that they brought in a different guy to coach. It was kind of unusual. All right. And, uh, you know, whatever. We're out of time. Mason, thanks for coming in. Danny, as always. See you uh, next Saturday on Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven.